So we have two things here um, that relate to denseness. The first is a definition, and the second is a theorem. And the theorem uses the definition, as most good theorems do. Um, so the first thing for us to wrap our heads around is what does it mean for something to be dense in something else, right? So we have to define what the term dense actually means. Um, and this is a pretty big deal, so let's take a look together. So it starts by saying a set of real numbers, and we can, because we don't, haven't really constructed the reals yet, we can pretend that this word isn't really here. Um, so let's just say a set of numbers um, is said to be dense. And maybe I'll blot this part out if we're not talking about real. Uh, it's said to be dense if every interval contains a point of E. So maybe as a picture, here's what we could be thinking about. If I have a number system, whatever number system that we happen to be thinking about, and for now, we're just going to call it the reals just for the sake of, uh, of argument, even though we haven't constructed them yet. Um, by, the time we, by the time we see this again, we will have constructed the real numbers. And so first, the first thing you notice is that this is a definition about a set and so we can't say that a number is dense. We can't say that a function is dense. We can't say, um, uh, that, I don't know, that a vector or something else is dense. This is a statement about a set. And so, so that means that we have some set E, which by our assumption here is a subset of the real numbers. And who knows what this set looks like? One of the surprises in real analysis, I think, um, as we get deeper and deeper into thinking about sets, and that's a major theme of the second half of our course, is that sets can be really complicated and scary. Um, they're not always the nicest things to write about, the nicest things to do analysis with, the nicest things to, to be able to write down a definition of. They can, have, they can be riddled with holes. Uh, they can be riddled with infinitely many holes. There can be all kinds of weird stuff that happens when we start trying to pin down a set. But let's just suppose that I know what this set E is and I can somehow, somehow shade in the number line in an appropriate fashion um, that will show me what the set E is. Okay. So this is a statement about a set. And we say that that set is dense if, and then the important part of this definition, as with the important part of any definition, comes after the word if. This is what actually defines the term for us. Every interval contains a point of E. So in other words, on my real number line, if I pick an open interval, so this is the first time that we're using this open interval notation in our course that hopefully you've seen before. You probably saw it in a calculus class or a pre-calculus class or, or something like that, right? If I write down the open interval from A to B, then what am I actually talking about? What elements belong to the set AB? What's the criteria for membership here? What does that notation actually mean? So when we read this interval A, B, we often read it in English as saying it's the interval from A to B. So presumably, A is a number that's less than or equal to B, right? Um, and so somewhere on my real number line, I have a number A and I have a number B. Um, but that by itself is not enough to precisely say what it means to belong to the open interval. So as with any set builder notation, what we'll do is we'll write down the name of a member of this set. Maybe I'll call it x. Um, and any time we write down intervals, unless we specify otherwise, these are going to be intervals of real numbers. Right? So it's the set of all real numbers x. Such that. So now is what, where we need to define what it means for x to belong to a set which goes, quote unquote, from A to B. What does that mean? What can I write down here that conveys that about the element x? Yeah. A so membership in this interval, a number x belongs to this open, we call it an open interval from A to B. Uh, if x is strictly greater than A, on the one hand, but x also needs to be strictly less than b on the other hand. Right? Um, so an example of an x on this number line which does belong would be, I don't know, some x in here. So that x would belong to the interval from a to b. If it were 
here on the number line because it would be strictly greater than a and strictly less than b, uh, whereas a number which is less than or equal to a or a number which is greater than or equal to b, those would not belong. And all we need in order to define, all we need to know about in order to define this interval is we just need to know what it means, first of all, for x to be a real number, and second of all, what it means for it to be greater than, what it means for one real number to be greater than another. Um, that's something that really, to put on a firm foundation, we need to get to our next step, uh, which is talking about the axioms uh, in the real number system. So we're going to get there. Um, but I think for now, we'll carry through our intuitive understanding of what it means for one number to be greater than another. Um, all right, so there's this, this open interval. That's what we mean by the open interval. Um, what other kinds of intervals are there, Just out of curiosity? Besides open intervals, what else do we know? Like, does the element, does the number A belong to the set? A doesn't belong to the set because A is not greater than A, which is something we'll come to appreciate when we talk about it axiomatically. But what if I wanted to create one of these intervals where A actually did belong? What would I have to change about the definition? Well, I would want to make this less than or equal to. And when I make that change, something else typically changes with the notation that we use to write the interval. What do I change? Yeah, I'll use a bracket instead of a parenthesis in front of the A. So interval notation is this convenient little shorthand that we can use to talk about chunks, what we might think of as continuous chunks of the number line going from A to B, and depending on whether we use brackets, less than or equal to, or round parentheses, which is a strict inequality, we either include the endpoints or we don't include the endpoints, or maybe we include one of them but not the other. Uh, for the purposes of the definition of denseness, we use an open interval, which does not contain its endpoints. Sometimes in a course like pre-calculus, you'll diagram that out on the number line by putting two open circles and then shading in between those two open circles. So sometimes that's how these intervals get depicted as a subset of the number line. So coming back to the definition of dense. Dense means that any open interval of real numbers that I choose is going to what? There's going to be an element of the set E in that interval. No matter where I place that interval, I can find at least, well, we're going to come back to this, at least one element of E. So here's an example of an element, let me call it little e, which belongs to E. And because of where I've sketched it here, it actually is evidently a subset of the open interval from A to B. Why? Because it's strictly greater than A and it's strictly less than B. So this particular open interval contains an element of E. But is it enough that this open interval contain an element of E in order for E to be dense? Take a look again at the definition. Which intervals have to contain a point of E? Every interval that we could possibly choose of the real numbers needs to contain a point of E. So let's be, let's be super concrete about this for a second. Uh, let me put my real number line back up. So here's a definition of a, of a set of real numbers. It's a set of all real numbers whose square is less than or equal to 4. And the question is, is E dense in R? Or is E dense? Maybe is another way to just say that in shorthand when the context is clear. What do you think? So when you look at it, the, the real numbers from negative 2 to 2 belong to this set. What about negative 2 and 2 themselves? Yeah, they actually do belong here, right? So if we were using the old-fashioned way of sketching an interval, we would shade in some closed circles. So this is another way to understand what this set is. In interval notation, we would write it as minus 2 to 2 and use what kind of brackets? Square brackets, because we're including those endpoints. Okay, so there's another way to write this set. Is E dense in R? Well, in order to test this theory, we need to prove whether or not it's true that every interval of real numbers that I choose is going to contain a point for me. What do you think? What's your hunch, first of all? What's your gut feeling about this? Because this is a really sweeping statement, it's a universally quantified statement. It has this every word in the hypothesis, right? Um, we can get a sense for whether it's true just by picking some examples. 
Let's say I pick AB to be 0, 1. That would be this interval right here, right? Does that interval contain a point of E? Yeah. Right? It contains actually a bunch of points of E. Um, if I pick the interval 0 to 3 or something like that, does that interval contain a point of E? Yes. Sure. It contains a whole bunch of points of E. Um, is it possible for me to choose an interval of real numbers that does not contain a point of E? Yes. What? Which one? What's an example? Three. Sure. How about the interval from 3 to 4? <coughs> right? So if I choose AB to be 3, 4, now we run into a problem with this definition, right? So the interval 3, 4, it is not true that that interval contains a point of E. Right? And because this was a universal statement that we were trying to, to demonstrate, <coughs> right, having one counterexample is enough to conclude that it's false. Right? If we uncover the logical structure of this, and this is how we're going to ease our way into proofs as we get uh, later into the semester, the logical structure of this says that in order to be dense, it needs to be true that for all A that I pick and for all B that I pick, which are real numbers, such that A is less than or equal to B, right, the following is supposed to be true. That within the interval from A to B, there has to exist, so I'm using this logical notation, this logical shorthand, there has to exist an element x such that x belongs to E and that x is in between A and B, right? In other words, it has to belong to the interval <coughs> between A and B. So this is the logical quantifier content of this definition. E is dense. If it's true that for all A and all B that I pick with A less than or equal to B, we can show that there exists an x that belongs to the set E which is in between A and B. The negation of the statement, so if I turn that around and I want to know what it would take to disprove the statement, the negation, what does it do with these logical quantifiers when we negate? It turns them into existential. That's right. It turns universal to existential. So the opposite statement is there exists an A and there exists a B with A less than or equal to B, such that and then this universal quantifier exists, turns into, sorry, this existential quantifier turns into a universal. For all x in E, it's not true that x is between A and B. So I'm going to kind of write that like this. It's not true that x lies between A and B. So one or the other of these two statements is going to be true about any set E of real numbers. And whichever one of them is true determines whether we say that E is dense or whether we say that E is not dense. And our example here, where A is 3 and B is 4, proves this gray statement to be true. Right? There exists an A, 3. There exists a B, 4. And 3 is indeed less than or equal to 4. And that A and B have the property that all elements of this set are not between A and B. And so we have to answer in the negative, E is not dense in our 